Hi guys, welcome to episode 25 of Fear of a Black Planet. Um, I am fighting off a cold right now. <coughs> um, it's bloody Baltic. I think I'm getting soft. I've been down in London too long. And uh, my hardy Scottish jeans are devolving into English jeans. And I really need to sort that out. I say hardy Scottish jeans, but you know, I'm not really one of those... Uh, Claymore wielding Highlanders. I'm a sort of hybrid blend of Highland and Lowland, and uh, so I was pretty much, in Scottish terms, a Southern Jesse before I even got to London. But uh, I think it's getting worse. I think I'm degenerating. Although I like the cold. In other ways, um, as long as you're wrapped up warm, I really like London in the cold because there's only so much. It's like London in the rain. There's only so much shit people can get away with. Um, the cold tends to even things out. It's like, just takes the edge off bullshit, bad weather. That's, I think, actually why I really like it. It's not because I'm, it's not just because I'm a miserable sod. Um, although that's definitely true uh, more often than not. But um, yeah, it's, it's just when, when things are this cold, things genuinely become more stilled, people's minds become more stilled, the streets become more stilled, the nights become more stilled, and uh, that means less bollocks, less bullshit, less uh, aggravation. Although having said that, I was up in, uh, I had a kind of failed operation today. I went up to Walthamstow to, uh, to see the William Morris Gallery. But I just got there too late, basically. I'm always doing that. <coughs> <coughs> Leaving things too late, and then by the time I get out of the house, I've got another hour journey, and then by the time I've done the hour journey, it's like too late for whatever cool thing that I decided I was going to do. So I was going up to Walthamstow. When the repairs of Walthamstow is like really nice, you know, like you still feel that there's, there's, it's a little bit sort of like on the edge of wood green before you get to, to Enfield kind of feel. Um, but there are a lot of twats around there as well, you know, just this sort of aggression in the air. Um, and I've realised as I get older, not only do I admit to myself that I'm not built for that kind of aggressive, like, thuggery in the street, like, you know, are you man up? Can you can you face them down? Can you walk past them confidently? It's like, well, no, not really, because, you know, if they jumped me, I'd be dead. And, um... But at the same time, I just... I, I have no patience for it either. I look down on that kind of behaviour, and there's a lot of that kind of behaviour. It reminded me of Wood Green, that everyone's got a kind of hunted look about them. Um... And there's no excuse for it. It's not something to do with class. It's not something to do with poverty. It's not something to do with anything. There's no social reason for it. It's just there's a general uh, belief that being, you know, being a dick makes you stronger in certain parts of London. Um, it's not so bad in Vauxhall because it's pretty much a gay area. <laughs> so it's like, that's not to say there's not aggression, but it manifests itself in different ways, I guess. Um... But there's just certain areas of London where the machismo is so fucking high. And I'm sick and tired of it, you know? Um, I, I'm, And that probably makes me sound like an elitist or some kind of twat. And I actually don't care. I don't care. If you don't like it, switch off the podcast. Because I really have got to that stage. It's like, well, there's no excuse for being a dick. Um, and I hold myself to that standard as much as I hold anyone else to that standard. So... So there you go, um, and you know the, I suppose the I suppose the machismo always is there and it manifests itself in different ways. So I was up in Chelsea, you know, going for a walk, um, and you know yeah, the, the, there's that sort of uh, posh twat machismo, ya boy machismo, which you know I've had plenty of dealings with in the past, which I have no. Um, no time for either and I've never been able to compete in that kind of let machismo either um, having said that there, you know, I quite enjoy just walking around the quiet streets in Chelsea because there's not a dickhead in sight you know <coughs> these rich guys have got it have got it sorted out 
Um, um, and I've just got to this stage where as I am not going to pretend to be some man of the people. I'm not a man of the people. Middle class as it fucking gets. And I like peace and quiet. And I like contemplation. And that's just who I am. And I don't think that there's any excuse for behaving like a knob jockey and then people turning around and saying, oh, with this social reason, that social reason. Um, I think that's a real, you know, like, we need to... If You know, you know the thing that's going to sort society out? Good fucking manners. Good fucking manners. And I don't care. I know that probably makes me sound like a, a reactionary. But I think that's one of the things that really bothers me about hipsters. Is they have no manners. That there's a pretense of nicety. There's a pretense of civilised behaviour in the sense that there's a sort of adoption of creative bohemianism as a fashion statement. But underneath it is bad manners. And the, uh, the ultimate root of all bad manners is assuming that someone else's internal interiority um, is of less significance to yours. That's what bad manners is. It's not being da 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 class, it's not being da 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 social reason, it's not some quasi Marxist ridiculous class based thing. It's just fucking bad manners. And I think that I've been thinking a lot about the free speech stuff and the political correctness stuff. It's not that I don't recognise some of the arguments for treating each other better, but I don't think that I think that um the political correctness and uh, a lot of the hipsterism, it all, all jumped into one. It puts the face of decency, puts the face of dignity, dignity, but the actual reality of it, when you come into contest with it, is bad manners. It, uh, it gives people a justification to behave badly, and you can see that from all these YouTube videos of people going on about political correctness. They behave like twats. Um, and... I think that there's some. I think that the types of people that are attracted to, to the ideologies of of political correctness are certainly of a low IQ, and uh, certainly of uh, and 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 you know I know there's going to be people who are sort of slightly angered by what I'm saying. I don't care, because I'm not I'm not advocating bad manners. I'm actually advocating good manners. So I just yeah, I've just got to the stage where I can't be asked with with. Uh, a lack of gentility and a lack of civilised behaviour and to the extent which I feel in that and I know I have and I know that I can go on social media sometimes and be a real dick and bark at people and I'm trying not to do that I'm trying not to be that kind of dick anymore um, I think I'm getting old you know I think I'm getting to that stage where I'm 35 and I just think actually <coughs> sometimes the old traditions of good manners are really the bottom line because good manners goes below is is there's a version of good manners which again like the the hipsters and the political correctos and the fucking nut job lefties um that can be a, a false good manners which only goes skin deep and it's there to mask what is actually the opposite of good manners but um if you're really adopting civilized behavior it's about ritualizing a sense of common decency, um, and that's where I'm getting to. Um, but I have I have no time for for um, half-assed civilization. Um, if you are not interested in beauty as the ultimate virtue of human behavior human contemplation, human uh, lived life, daily lived life according to the virtue of beauty, then turn off the podcast now. I'm not interested in you. I'm not interested in playing music to you. I'm not interested in writing to you. You're not my audience. You're not my tribe. The people I'm interested in are the people who, who see that beauty is truth and truth is beauty. And they don't have to ask what I mean by that. It's definitely one of those things that if you're having one of those little, but what about the cheese beauty so If you're having that moment, if you have to ask, you will never know. Um. So. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm. Uh, I'm no longer going. To
willing to accept the, a desire for higher civilizational values is somehow snobbery, is somehow elitist. I don't care if it is those things, because I know that the only thing that's actually going to save society is a sense of of uh, decency. And I and I and I mean that when I say I'm going to hold myself to that standard as well. Uh, it's been a. I haven't made a podcast for a wee bit because it's, there's been so much going on. I was up in Scotland, which was awesome. It was on a stag do, um, but it wasn't like a <laughs> one of those stag do, you know, like your classic stag do. It was just the three of us going up, revisiting sort of childhood haunts. And uh, we went up to St Andrews where we were all at university. And I think this is one of the things that played into what I've just been saying, is that I couldn't... <coughs> so I was a bit worried about it because it, St Andrews is one of those small university towns where you can really become one of those uh, sheltered, secluded people very easily and a lot of people do and it isn't very good for your mental health and I was nearly one of those people I stayed, I was in, in a total for seven years so I stayed on for a couple of years after and worked but that was a terrible decision in many ways, I think. I should have left. and um, One of the reasons I didn't go back for nearly ten years, nine years, was for that reason. I was just sick of the place and it felt small town. And To a large extent, St Andrews is a bit like Durham. It's a sort of uh, posh finishing school for a lot of people. But not your Oxbridge types is the ones that are not as smart. But it's changed a bit now since I was there. It's actually the 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 caliber of student is much higher than when I was there. Certainly, I wouldn't be able to get in now. Probably, um, well, certainly not with the marks I got. I think I could, you know, still if I if I really wanted to. But um, in that it, for for all those reasons, it was really nice to go back. Um, I think we were lucky in this. It was quiet for some reason that weekend. <coughs> it's not reading week, but it was, there was something going on that weekend. There must have been. Um, just It must have just hit um, that weekend that it was going to be quiet. So it felt very civilised. And it was... Now, I know more about Scottish history and way more about the history of St Andrews and the, the Reformation and, and all those things that I was living around, you know. And to go back now, when I've, when I've lived in London, where a sense of, an, an, a sense of history and a sense of uh, belonging are very precious, they become more precious to you. One of the things that l happens when you live in Scotland is... Um, you you kind of become uh, what's the word uh, privileged entitled uh, you, well you, you're blind to how to how lucky you are to be around so much history all the time that is one thing about Scotland there isn't really one patch of the country even in shite holes you know even in your worst like post-industrial meltdown apocalypse kind of area the history is is still only just beneath the surface and each town has a very rich history and, <coughs> and living in London where every day I'm looking to, to, to try and, and, and one of the things I love about London is the history but it's becoming I think my experience is becoming increasingly hard to connect with that that energy of history that was one of the reasons I moved here, um, because of the development and because of the sort of ideology of the concretization ideology, um, that seems to just be completely unchallenged. Um, so going back to Scotland and specifically going back to St Andrews was lovely. Really lovely to connect with that energy. It felt like the the university town I'd always wanted it to be, which was a small community um, of uh, smart people, <laughs> you know, 
I mean, when I was there, I just, I mean, I blame myself entirely. I just got completely drunk most of the time, went to house parties and pissed it all up against the wall, really, and got through it on the skin of my teeth. And uh, a big part of me wishes I could go back and just knuckle down and not not get involved in too much socialising or whatever. Um, but it was lovely to go back. There was a, a real... There was a real... Um, contemplative atmosphere it was just getting very cold and windy and I suppose I was biased because I was with mates and we kept ourselves to ourselves and we went for long walks along the pier and all that stuff but it was uh, yeah it was all a bit bright head and it was very nice and uh, my point I guess about it is that I'm incredibly proud to have gone and uh, I think, certainly in my working life, it's almost like I've had to apologise either to Cambridge, Oxbridge types who see look down on someone going to St Andrews as a kind of fake version of them, um, or they just look down on anything Scottish as not being quite good as English, which is definitely a thing, which people shouldn't deny. Um... Or they have an inverse snobbery, and that's a very strong thing. And that's one of the things that's kind of made me get to this point where I cannot stand inverted snobbery because you know what? Inverted snobbery is not some man of the people kind of thing. What it is is a resentment, a, the most middle class of middle class resentments. That there might be someone higher than you, there might be someone who's achieved more than you. And so the, even, the, even the mere suggestion that you went to an arts and humanities university and spent five years swanning around in a gown studying philosophy is an affront to anybody who went to fucking some, you know, university of arse wind, you know. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to I'm not going to take on other people's insecurities in that manner. Um, I don't care. I, I, I tell young guys if you know, don't go to university unless unless you're a fucking want to be a doctor or an engineer or you are like I was at one point extremely passionate about the subject. But even then if it's an art subject like philosophy or English, I mean just fucking get a job working as a T boy in a newsroom. Um, you know. So it's not about snobbery from my end, it's about an, a resentment of or, or um um a lack of time for for what is actually resentment and people who go on about posh people in this and rich people usually they just would or are whining about this guy's success or that guy selling out or blah 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 usually almost always there's a resentment behind it it's not some man of the people thing um it's like george orwell said about uh most of the left is particularly the Hampstead middle class left. And that's most of the left. That's probably you. Um, are not really pro-working class. Because if they were pro-working class, what they would be pro is social mobility. Um, what they really are is about they're, they're anti-people above them. So they join, they, 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 they seem to make common cause. They become fellow travellers with the working class. Because they feel that uh, that's where their hatred of anyone higher up than them in the social status strata. <coughs> that's where that resentment can reside and it can give it a moral high ground. And um, Jacques, I accuse you of that. And if it doesn't resonate with you, then fine, let it go. I'm not talking to you. But if it does burn a little bit, I'm talking to you. Um, and I have no time for that. I have no time for that because, and I'm speaking as someone who, I'm sick of it in myself. It's the most bourgeois thing to pretend you're not bourgeois. Um, so the upshot is, I'm actually, it was an opportunity to look back and think, you know what, I'm fucking proud. Or, I mean, I did not, <laughs> you know, like, I, I went, I dropped out of a posh boarding school and went to Dundee College, FE College. Um, so... The idea that I, I don't even know how I got in St Andrews. I just did an access course. Didn't even do hires or A-levels. Did an access course. <coughs> Which is what you do when you're either a, you know, a desperate mature student or just desperate. 
and uh, I got into St Andrews at a time when they were taking people in philosophy they needed to fill the spaces and I'm proud of the hustle man I'm proud of the fact that I hustled my way into that university and you know why I'm most proud of it it's not because it's a, a very posh university because it's not it, it, there is a truth to the fact that it's sort of masquerading and trying to be like one lecturer laughingly described it as more Oxbridge than thou but what I think it's better than Oxbridge I really do and I wouldn't have said that six months ago six months ago I was in that kind of apologetic phase you know I would, I would be apologizing to you saying yeah no it's this it's not quite this it's that it's not quite this it's not this don't don't don't, don't feel like I'm bigging myself up or I'm bigging myself up um because it was fucking hard for a dumbass like me to fucking get to that level I'm fucking proud of it and it's also the it's it's the University of Scotland it's it's connected to the European tradition of universities in a Scottish way not in some imitation of England way. And there's all sorts of reasons which I won't talk about or people that I admire who went there who I won't talk about because he was Googling. Um, but I'm extremely proud of going there and I'm extremely proud of what I've achieved in my life. So you might want to stop there because that probably is an affront to you that anybody would be proud of themselves or anybody would be um, content with what they've achieved. Um, so yeah, I'm glad about that, and it was you know, it was a, it was a nice opportunity to be able to just go. You know, okay, I'm a bit of a jackass, but I'm the one thing I am proud of is is having gone to St Andrews. It was one of the great achievements of my life to to pull myself through that. God knows how I did it at the age of 23, I don't know, because as much as I am a fucking Egypt now, I was more of an Egypt back then. Um, oh yeah, and there was the election, that, that all that stuff with Trump. And, um, I mean, if you, if, if you want my take on all that... <coughs> <coughs> well, for one, I don't believe in all these simplifications that are going around, like it was racism, blah, 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 or the other one, which was it was the left's fault. There's truth in both of those sides, gen genuinely. Um, but I, I, I'm of the opinion that it was mostly economic, and there's a pretty compelling case for that. It would seem that a lot of the places that, the sort of Rust Belt places that voted for Trump were not just voting because he was a strong man or was appealing to their most their resentments, although there is that. But he was actually saying things like, we're going to stand up to China, we're not going to... And a lot of these places have, have, have lost their economies to other parts of the world. So it, w it was a vote against globalisation, but it wasn't an ideological vote. It was just people voting from their guts, you know? Just like, well, this is... You know, you, you're asking my opinion, I'll give it to you. Same thing with Brexit. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about that, but I'm not an expert. I just, I'm, I I think there was a, a lot more of it was, was just purely economic, purely people voting with their own interests at heart. Not selfishly, but for their family and for their communities. And... Uh, it's too simple to say it was a vote against the liberal elite, which it was, or it was a, uh, uh, what was it, dog whistle politics from Trump, which a large part of it was. Um, but a lot, of, a, a lot of these things don't have as much weight if there isn't an economic reason to do it. And to me, the proof of that fact is the fact, is the idea, you know, why did British people, for instance, vote Tony Blair in a left of centre? For, to all intents and purposes, let's just, for the sake of argument, say that a left of centre guy for three three consecutive administrations, and why did they vote for Obama two times in a row? And then all of a sudden there's this switch. Um, to say that it was racism, that doesn't quite fit with that, with me, if you're talking about Brexit or the Trump vote. Because if you look at the, the it, it's people's disillusionment, they were promised a certain thing and they didn't get it. And that's what happened to both Blair and Obama. Um, promising, what essentially they both promised, and I remember 
1997 like it was yesterday. And I can remember 2008 too. And they were promising not just a change of administration or even um, a, a pivot towards a different way of looking at things. Both explicitly were promising systematic change. That the, the, the system would no longer be rigged towards the rich. Um, and so people went for the left of centre version of that. They were like, okay, let's, let's go with this. We need this now. And it didn't happen. So all the nut jobs came out in their droves. Um, but I, I mean, I, as I say, I'm, not, I'm just doing my own research at the moment. I'm not pretending to be an expert on it. But what I do think is that this idea that we can simplify it um, to either stupid people, racist people, or just angry people is too much. It, it was all those things, but it was there was there were deeper things going on. Um, trying to cover a lot of ground here. I'm not. I should stop trying to do that because. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I guess one of the reasons I had, had avoided making a podcast for all, for a couple of weeks there was because there, when so much of this stuff is going on, um, there's so much noise now, and there is a doubt in the back of your mind when you're doing something like this, like a podcast of your own, and you're putting your own stuff on YouTube and SoundCloud and blah, 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 blah. There is this thing as an artist or an aspiring broadcaster or, or a journalist, anybody that wants to demand attention from the public in some way, you do feel there's a little voice in the back of your mind going, really, does, is this what the world needs, another fucking podcaster? Is this what the world needs, another blogger? Um, and sometimes that voice gets the better of me. Um... But I was when I was walking through Walton store today, I did it did occur to me that <coughs> <coughs> there's another way of looking at it, you know, that you could be cynical and just say, Oh, the world doesn't need another podcaster, man. Um or you could say In times like this, in times of saturation, in times of so much noise, not all the time, but there are certain moments where it's actually your duty to, to crank up the project a little bit, to, to rev it up, to go faster, to shout louder, to to make yourself more... To, to demand louder to be heard. And I don't mean shouting down others. I'm not that's not what I mean. I'm trying myself to do that less and less. And I'm trying genuinely to to, to, to rely much more on, on on persuasive argument and um rigor because I've realized as much as I hate these people who, who hide behind those terms and I do, because a lot of people do, and what they're really hiding is that they don't care. But if you're passionate about something, then it's worth showing the... I've realised, this is a bit of humble pie from me. I've realised that the, 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 if you're really committed and passionate about something, you really have to be airtight, rigorously, with it. And, and so that's another reason I've been shutting up, because I realise, well, <clears throat> there's not much point in saying something if you haven't got you know, something that's going to really put the fear into fear of God into an opposing debater. And I don't mean shouting, I mean, you know, that will make them not want to try and argue with you anymore. Just by the sheer force of what you're saying. Um, so it, it's a matter of commitment, I realise, that being rigorous. There, there are people who fetishise rigour and science and blah blah. I'm a man of reason, but those people I hate it's just as much as I ever did because really underneath that is let's not talk about this stop talking about this why are you so emotional um, and that's just as bad that's but it's, it's very difficult to argue with those people because on the one level they're right you should be more rigorous and if you have lost the argument you've lost the argument so blah 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 but 
I I have a feeling more often than not people who make a big show and dance about being so logical and reasonable and rational and that becomes like their sort of super ego that really what they're doing is trying to shut you up and really what they're doing is what they're what they're feeling is resentful and jealous of you for even having an original thought so that the again going back to the hipster mentality the idea that you might have an original thought that they didn't think of people are terrified of people are terrified of someone knowing something they don't that's the biggest academic fear the academic mindset cannot stand that there might be something someone else knows or that there might be some creative intelligence to which they don't have access to to which their reading and their book learning doesn't give them access to having said that i recognize the 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 need to tool up argumentatively and so i promise from now on to try my best to be more rigorous and more my for, for my arguments to be better thought out rather than just sincere impassioned outbursts although sometimes there's something to be said for that and i will always try for it to be in a sincere outburst or a, an outburst of sincerity but i'll try and distill it better that's that's where i want to go i want to become more rigorous and less open to being dismissed as just a ranter and a raver, which I know a lot of my enemies do and like to like to say. Um. So yeah, that's kind of that's where I'm at. And but yeah, I was thinking, you know, <clears throat> it's very easy to to lose faith in in these times and think, does the world really need my voice? But it's really um about quantity ver quality versus quantity. Yes, there's a lot of there are lot we're saturated it's a saturated culture. But there there really isn't um very much culture that stands out. The democratization of culture has been good in one way because it it, it allows people who would otherwise who who are genu who have genuinely got something to say who would otherwise be shut down because of class or, or social mobility or what or access to technology <coughs> it gives them a voice but what it has done is give everybody who can use that technology the illusion that they've got something worthwhile to say now where i fit in there i do not know but i have to work from the from the working assumption that i fall into the former category that um i now have something have something to say and i now have the access to say it and i think that if you're <coughs> if you're sincere about your ideas you have to put faith that that will cut through the noise um the answer i found is not to bow out of the fight or the battle of ideas just because it's becoming um more saturated or, or or the culture is becoming more chaotic or uh, you feel drowned out um the way to deal with it is to ensure that you give yourself contemplative space to nurture your ideas better um so that's what i that that ties in with what i've been saying about trying to be more rigorous trying to be more articulate trying to be uh more firm and, and, and more thorough with with my thinking and my ideas um, and that's the challenge for me in the next year is to uh, to to distill my ideas into a into a, a much more potent spirit um, because it's that which will burn through the shit and um, yeah, that's the, that's the real challenge, and um, it, the answer and the answer is very much not to shut up and to 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 hold yourself away and to hide away from the culture. That's not what the world needs right now. What the world needs, the 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 saturation and overload of the culture is only a problem because it allows so many of us to just fly off the handle to jump out and say crap right away um so 
uh, the the answer is to just not do that. It doesn't mean to shut up, and that's what I that's where I've come to. That that's the the sort of uh, little realization I, I I'm coming to. It's the uh, it's important to to raise your voice, but you're only going you're only going to cut through the bullshit if you refine your ideas, and and that involves embracing this new technology, embracing the, the potential for a new kind of communication, a new kind of media, a new kind of broadcasting, but in some ways reverting to an old kind of contemplation where you're able to pull yourself back from that cultural battleground and refine your ideas. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a weird one. I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but um, it's... We are, I do believe that um, we are entering a new phase of... of what I what I call it public space that the 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 next we we talk a lot about private private space being in jeopardy in in the modern world and God knows it fucking is um but I think one of the things that we really need to fight for is public space um and we really need to make sure that um with the with the saturation of technology and the corporate structures and the lack of corporate accountability or the lack of it's not i was thinking about this with corporatization of public space which i've ranted about before <coughs> it's not so much that it's I realize it, I, i'm not an anti-capitalist as such i just um what i don't like about it is the way people get who at, at the, when it gets to the top corporate level, power is not challenged, and it becomes imperialistic in the very true sense of the word. Like um, the way that imperial powers tend to to rot from the inside is they become too nepotistic and they become too entitled to their power, and that's hap that happens to corporations, and that's the problem that we have. And my issue with corporations controlling public space, which they always will to some extent, right? Because the big businesses and the big conglomerates have always built the cities. But it's the extent to which they go unchallenged that bothers me. The extent to which only a few people with very mundane ideas about what public space should be are dictating something so crucial to civic life and no more is that true than online, right? Um, so it's it's really uh, our duty to make sure that our idea, that we not only do we harness this technology and use it to make our voices heard, but that what is being heard is quality, that what's being heard is incisive, um, is uh, polished and uh, refined and devastating in its truth. Um, and, yeah, and so it's not just that that's the best way that you're going to be heard <laughs> to be truthful and to, to really be rigorous, but it's also the best way to maintain public space um, and public dialogue. And there's a real danger that with the revolution of of public discourse that's happening through YouTube and social media, and it is a revolution, anyone that's discounting it and still being slightly cock-hipped and hipster about it uh, really needs to grow the fuck up and wake up. Because um, this is this this is the future, and we're now living in it, and it's now. Because you know I've I you know I watched set a few debates online and. Really, the, the the way an idea now spreads online dictates the nature of the discourse. The the it dictates the likelihood or not of getting to the truth of the matter. The way that it it spreads online, and that and a lot of important discussions have now moved online. 
um, like the free speech debate, like the political correctness debate, like the Trump thing. I mean, it started probably <coughs> with Obama, then the Arab Spring. Those were the first two examples of thinking, actually, shit, hang on a minute. What happens online is now dictating what happens in the public space, in the physical world. And now, on I would say online is is the public space that um, and so the the but the good thing about it is that we can we are responsible for that public space absolutely it's um, it's absolute democracy <laughs> yeah so the extent to which you want to improve public space or the extent to which you are sick of the way public space is going you you now have the power to do something about it and. You, you can't sit around complaining about it unless you do something about it. So if you're sick of all these bloggers and you're sick of all these YouTubers and you're sick of this and SoundCloud has ruined the music industry, blah, 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 the answer is not to sit around whining about it because you'll be left behind. If that's what you want, that's what you want. But if you want to have some say, if you want to shape the debate in some way, you need to get off your arse and create something of quality yourself instead of whining and bitching about everyone else and feeling resentful that other people are, are, are egotistical enough to think that their voice should be heard. Because we're all egotistical and we all think our voice should be heard. But the that does, oh, we all know that that's not the test of a good idea. And you can have as much technology as you can, you know, as many podcasts as you want. The, the 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 marketplace of ideas is is to some extent even more brutal than the marketplace of economics um because an an idea takes root to the extent which it genuinely offers some evolutionary momentum to human culture so that hasn't changed um but the, the potential for being able to communicate one of those ideas has changed, and that's a real revolution. Um, and so the, the, the challenge then is, is to make sure that you, you, we do refine our ideas, do hone our ideas, do commit ourselves to the highest virtue in the, in the shaping of public discourse. And we don't just degenerate into self-congratulation and echo chambers. And maybe some people could say that this podcast is just one echo chamber, just one guy like with the sound of his own voice, whatever. Maybe that's true. But what, what I think it, more, what I'm going for with it, <coughs> and what I believe to be the value of this podcast, is more that the, the individual voice is a crucial part of civic life. The, our interiority and our individuality are what make us good citizens. And I would say my whole sort of political philosophy, as unformed as it still is, has something to do with that. That, the, the, that it's not about being individualistic in the Ayn Rand sense. It's more... That I am a good citizen when I reach my fullest potential. And I can only reach my fullest potential when I cultivate my interiority, when I cultivate my voice. Um, and I speak as true as I possibly can. <coughs> and I explore ideas through, through the singularity of my own voice. Um, and in doing so, you know, this is, you know, that's what an artist is. The artist says, this is my voice, I should be heard. And it empowers other people when they do that. Because they think, well, I feel like that too. My voice should be heard. I'm glad this guy said it, because I feel that too. And again, just, just using the, the, the saturation of the culture, or the, the overwhelming change of the culture, or the information overload of the culture, as an excuse not to raise your voice, that's petty. And I don't buy it. Because I do that. I, I have this conversation with myself all the time, but I actually think it's pathetic. Um, either your ideas are of value or they're not. It's very much the same. In, in a sense, I'm, I'm like the, you know, uh, economic libertarian of ideas. 
<laughs> you know, like, if you, you either have the skills or you don't. And, you know what, I'm quite prepared to, if, 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 if only 12 people listen to this podcast for the rest of my life, that's the way it's got to be, that's the way it's got to be, but I don't think so. I think as, as rambling and as uh, discordant and uh, un, unfiltered as it is in its current state, people will resonate with the, the, the sincere individuality of the of the voice that I'm projecting and and they'll they'll intuit that that individuality is important in the modern life uh in the mod- in, in the way that our modern public space because it's very difficult in in most of the public space to to affirm the individual voice so much of it's for some reason going towards collective thinking and yeah, um, I'm not. It's not so much about fighting something or standing for this ideology, or left or right. Or it's just affirming the the evolutionary force that the individual voice is. It's individuals that create the culture. It's not the culture that creates individuality. When the culture creates individuals, then we're in trouble. But if the individual decides to take culture and create it in his own image or her own image then we're really got a ball game okay i'm gonna leave it there (laughs) thank you very much for listening and i'll speak to you next week